Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Heartcast. This is a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together to take on various topics that tend to cross one's path when you go off on this dangerous adventure of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Design, coaching, and making interactive stuff. How you doing, Jersey? I'm doing okay. It's good to see you again. Uh, our ongoing adventures in uh, refining our live streaming setup so that we can do more interesting video. Uh, those adventures continue. We've got a late start today. What, 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 what are we? Like this doesn't matter to anybody watching after the fact. But yeah, we're 20 minutes late <laughs> to doing the stream because of all of the Skype. Skype. I'm looking at you, Skype. <laughs> mm. Skype is not our consistent friend. And, uh, and it, it's, it's been interesting. I mean, learning, you know, tools like, uh, uh, let's see, the, the virtual audio cables that Voice Meter uh, puts out and then Voice Meter Potato and using OBS and Virtual Cam and all this kind of stuff. There's some building blocks that I think have some stability, but yet... Um, Skype likes to just not um, play well. Yeah, it kicks a little, it kicks over the blocks a lot. <laughs> so we're trying yet another setup, and this seems to be stable. Let's proceed with doing the show. Um, so if you're new to the Lean Tart cast, um, gosh, we've got a lot of episodes in the the back catalog for you. So if you enjoy this, if I got a, a pleasant surprise for you, you could listen for a long time. Um, but our, our model is we usually pick a single topic and then look at what it looks like from the outside. What does it look like when we're doing the thing or experiencing the thing? And then we back up and we say, okay, well, how do we think about, you know, performing the action or experiencing the experience? And then we close with a little bit of this thing called the two-minute practice where we try to challenge ourselves every week to try out something new for two minutes at a go. A nice inexpensive way to try to continue to introduce practice into our work. Um, so what are we talking about this week, Rob? Well, I don't know if we, let's see, we want to practice navigating, uh, burnout. We don't want to practice burnout. Right. I think, <laughs> right, right. I think I got really good at that at an early age. I think I was quite natural, to, uh, quite a natural to, uh, to have a lot of ambition and to be just a little, uh, quite a bit in over my head. <laughs> so and then stay there. Yeah. <laughs> that's a quick rest. That's a recipe. I, I feel like that's actually like, if, if, not to go too deep on a tangent because we haven't actually started the, the, the topic proper, but I feel like that's like the purview of a young person. This is something I tell my students all the time is like, you know, this is the time where you're supposed to get in over your head because that's where like the really, really rich learning happens. And as long as it's not like physically or emotionally dangerous, a little bit of danger is actually a good thing, you know? Um, uh, that's a good point. Like we, like with, um, like, well, raising a couple of kids, um, we try to encourage, uh, sort of like intellectual curiosity and, uh, risk taking, right? So, you know, why not, uh, put yourself in a situation where you might learn a lot, even though it's like, it's difficult and you're probably going to make a bunch of mistakes and whatnot. But, um, yeah, uh, there's, yeah, it's a it's it's a different kind of adventure, right? You could take risks, all kind of ri all kinds of risks. I mean, physical, financial, emotional, social, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, intellectual is kind of the 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 one that seems to have uh, the biggest upside. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, on that positive note, let's get into the episode. Yep. Who knows if the video is working? <laughs> <laughs> and the music, we, the music indicates we're in a different section of the show now. So now we're in the part where we talk about what it looks like. This, this idea of burnout. Um. Yeah, it's it's a tricky topic, and it's it, it surprisingly you put brought this to my attention. Is like we haven't really addressed this face on in five years. Is that right? Um, yeah, it's interesting because we do, we talk about, well, like different, uh, very specific creative processes, maybe visual design, interactive design, all kinds of things anywhere in between evolving your, um, like 
wearing more hats as an independent creator and stuff like that. But then the, the, the nurturing aspect, like we, we've talked about self care a few times, but like burnout specifically, uh, yeah, it's been a while and it came up as like, I think on purpose, but during one of our emergent topic episodes <laughs> where I don't know if that's the meta situation where it's like, what do you want to talk about this week? I don't know. I burned out. <laughs> so yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, how about that? So it was, it was episode 141. So it was a while ago from November 13th, 2015. We'll link to it in the show notes if you want to go back and revisit it. But yeah, um, we took a look at what we talked about in that one. And, and so we have some uh, perspective on how we felt about it five years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, but let, let's also talk about how we feel about it now and piece together, uh, and, and anybody who's watching live, I would love to hear from you too, um, in the chat, like what does burnout look like or feel like to you? Um, and then maybe we can piece together in the second half, what some of the, the systems, what are some of the signals that we can get that, that tell us like, Oh, you're on the cusp. If you don't readjust, change course, do something, burnout is inevitable. Right. Um, so what about you, Rob? Like, what does, what does burnout look or feel like to you? Mm. It's, it's tough to distinguish sometimes about um, like feeling, uh, feeling a lot of resistance or uh, overwhelmed or disconnection to what I know I need to do next. Um, or choosing among all the things that I may have committed to and which thing do I work on right now? How do I, and, and then just not being on the ball and, and sort of not, not feeling really good or skilled at choosing among those things and then feeling bad about not feeling good at it. And so I think mostly burnout feels like feeling bad. Like, yeah, like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I remember when I turned forty. We've talked about this a couple times on the show because you know, that was a long time ago now. Well, five years. Uh, actually, around the time we did that emergency topic episode, I remember uh, <laughs> the 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 classic cliched conversation started happening in my brain with like, "Oh, you're forty. What do you got to show for your time?" And I was like, my my internal dialogue was like, "Shut up, you. We're not that guy. We're not gonna go get a sports car and start acting weird. You know, like you you are more intelligent and in tune with yourself and more creative than that, surely." And then I was like, no, you didn't do enough. And then I started getting mad at myself because I couldn't shut that voice down. I'm like, okay, so I guess I am really that much of a cliche. And it started this echo chamber of me being angry at myself from two sides. And I literally spent a year being angry. Like it was just like, it was this constant, uh, I wouldn't say I was, I wasn't like shouting at people in the checkout lanes, but like, it was like, I, I had this like persistent feeling of anger. And I feel like burnout for me has that same kind of echo chamber quality to it where it's like, mm. There's too many things to do. I can't catch up. Uh, no matter how hard I try, I can't catch up. I'm losing interest in this stuff. Why am I working so hard on this thing that I'm never going to be able to accomplish? And who even cares about it anyway? And like all those negative sort of like threads start leaking in and start filling the basement, you know? Um, and it, it, it's, uh, it, I feel overwhelmed and I feel like the work has lost some of its meaning and purpose. Like that's how I would define it, um, and then and then uh, and then I get mad at myself for losing touch with what makes me feel energized about the work in the first place. So that also contributes to it. Like a, like a recrimination kicks in. It is a yeah. There is a big feedback loop aspect to it, isn't there? This 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 just sort of negative spiral. Um, and just what you're describing, like metaphorically, it's almost like eating too much of something that I don't like anyway, or something where it's like, I'm, I'm full, I'm not satisfied. And uh, that's a certain kind of frustration that I think saying burnout describes pretty well, where mm. um, I'm full of negativity, I'm, I'm not feeling accomplished. And uh, because, well, feeling accomplished is a pretty quick antidote to other negative voices. For yeah, me, yeah, right? yeah. And it's got to be different. That that's different for others. 
But. That's that's very true. I it, I had a sort of like one of the reasons I proposed this topic too is I had a bit of a I wouldn't say epiphany. That's too big of a word, but I had like a kind of like a, a, a light bulb moment when I was talking with a friend about something we we're to talk about in the second ad break. Um, I put together this game show project that you know I've been working on for several weeks now, like slowly piecing together and trying to solve this problem of like how do you do the kind of game shows we have at the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival, but do it virtually, vi- online video, and is you know we've talked about a lot. I'm not interested in just doing it with video. What can video do that other that, that that real life can't? How can we imp- improve the experience so that this thing can exist as its own thing? And if we did it as a live event, it would be a different thing, right? So like that's like that's the kind of puzzle that gets me really excited and interested. But um, when I finished it, when I when I beat the puzzle, I was talking with a friend about. It, I was expressing real like ex- excitement, and enthusiasm. I'm like I can't wait till people get to watch this thing. It's really really cool. And he's like, uh, "What was it about that that like your tone totally changed? Like you sounded really tired and really worn out a moment ago. But you talked about that. You sounded like a different person. Like what was it about that project that made you so feel so good?" And I was like, "Wow, what a friend to actually ask me that question of like purposefully make me pause and reflect on what what they're seeing." And I was like, you know, I know who it's for. I solved an interesting problem, right? There was a problem to get something to somebody, and I know who they are. I can name the audience. I can name the audience, and I can name the needs of the participants who are putting together the thing. And I found a way to, set, to, to serve all of them in a way that feels unique and interesting. And I don't even care if I get credit for it. It's that. It's the, it's the act of solving an interesting problem for a specific group of people and being able to cross my arms and go, yes. All right, now everybody else, step up. Let's do this stuff all the time, you know? Um, and, and I think when I'm experiencing burnout, it's like there's disconnects on all of those threads. There, the, the service isn't clear to me. Who am I really? I, I've had comics projects bomb for me. Like I've I've failed comics projects, not finished them because halfway through I'm like, what? Who am I even doing this for? I don't even know who this is for. And when I, the moment I lose touch with that, I'm s- suddenly not interested in the thing, right? Um, and then there's also the whole like I'm not solving the puzzle. I can't figure this puzzle out. I'm trying to solve this problem, and I don't want to just do it the obvious way. I want to find the interesting way to do it. If that's not clear after a certain amount of time, then I feel like, okay, well, I'm clearly not skilled enough to do this thing. That causes disinterest and disengagement and, and bad feelings, right? Um, but then uh, there's another layer to it, like you were describing, where it's like, I have too many things clamoring for my attention, right? How do I make just one of them go away? <laughs> How do I make just one of them finish so I can move on to the other things, right? So... Oh, yeah. All of that leads to, uh, you know, just feeling kind of um, leaded, you know, tired, disinterested, disengaged. And uh, I don't know. I don't want to say that, like, because I, I don't want to like, get into that dangerous realm where I'm like wrapping up my identity too much in what I do. But it is a big part of, of how I look at myself, right? I'd laugh at that. We, I mean, it's something we've characterized now for almost nine years. We both really wrap up a lot of our personal value in what we, yeah. um, I know this is something that, that I know we've talked about, we work on, we've explicitly mentioned this. So I know I'm not just throwing, you know, assumptions and words at you that uh, we we're not you know, building on nine years of conversations with you where, it's uh, it feels good to. I think it's it's it's. A, I think that's a little bit interconnected. Where you have this idea of a purpose and a label for that purpose and a label that you get to assign to yourself, which gives you some clarity and belonging, and uh, and both for you and for who you're connecting with. That's nice. I mean, like it's it's that helps actually. But then to um, if that's the only place where we're getting our, our sort of positive feedback from, then uh, you're, I mean, cause it's guaranteed that, that you're some, and it, it just won't work forever. Like whatever that is, it just won't keep working. Aspects of it are going to change because of the environment, because of your audience, because of something is just, um, it's not infinitely sustainable, I guess, to, to say that, you know, 
because the job's going to change. The stuff changes. Um, you're going to change. Um, and uh, it's, which is an interesting um, circumstance where like burnout could look like, I believed this, let's see. So maybe you formed a hypothesis for like a, like a business idea to test. And then you go through all this effort to, um, to bring like a credible, useful test into the world to see if your idea has, um, does it have an audience? Uh, can you really make it? And, you know, and then also, um, will, will there be some kind of value exchange that works to make it sustainable, right? The whole, the classic, you know, Venn diagram of feasibility, viability, and desirability. You're going through all this stuff for some given that, that, that super hypothesis that's made up of these other hypotheses of like, yeah, this makes it desirable. This makes it feasible. This makes it viable. And together it's going to be great. That can be a ton of work. That's a lot of hats to wear just right there to do the homework, to get the idea, to make it strong enough, incredible to do the thing. But then you do the thing and you may now no longer believe it. <laughs> uh, and so then there's a then what? So what do you do with that, um, that transition? So in a way, it's so, sometimes burnout is, it can be a sense of, um, uh, mm, Maybe, maybe a sense of loss for saying like, I believed in the thing and now, now I don't. Mm. And that can come from a lot of places. It can just come from being tired, right? Mm -hmm. um, where you have other needs that are like, hi, you're more than just this one thing. <laughs> um, live more <laughs> than just, just this one thing. <laughs> but like, it, it can really be like, you just don't agree with what you were doing anymore. Mm, yeah, that's that. That is also, uh, I think, a valuable insight. Is that the, I think another thing that you and I have done over the last nine years is sort of celebrate that we are fluid creatures that are always changing and evolving, and hopefully, you know, in a thoughtful way. <laughs> But uh, just just as no con no plan survives contact with the ground, no person remains unchanged with uh, upon contact with the world, right? And so, um, yeah, that that burnout can happen because it can all, it can be maybe a sense of grief over uh, I believed in this thing and I don't believe it anymore. It could be burnout because it's like, well, now I feel committed to this thing that I no longer I feel like I have a lot of. I don't know what the word before, but like motivation to participate in. Well, investment, right? Yeah. Sunk cost fallacy can yeah. be also, it's like, well, I don't believe it, but I, I, I started it or I got to finish it or whatever. And it depends, right? Maybe you're in a contract and yeah, you will have to um, figure out like the, the, like, how do you want to shape this, this situation? How do you want to change it? Um, so that's, I know, probably more second half, but, um, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. But I, I like this idea of exploring a lot of different ways of like that, what burnout has looked like for us in the past and what it can look like. Um, generally speaking, it's a, for me, it's a sense of disengagement and frustration. Like, uh, the, the visual metaphor I always use when I'm talking to friends is like, um, in my head, it's like, I want to just like people bend, like in like Air, Avatar Last Airbender. I just want to push my arms out like this and everybody just goes away for like, give me a day, give me a day just to not be anything. I think that's another piece of burnout for me sometimes is somebody who has to do a lot of teaching, has to, well, that was a weird word, who does a lot of teaching. I enjoy it. I love it. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching an online class right now. And uh, yesterday I had, a, uh, Tuesday I had a class of teenagers and it was so much fun. And since you could hear me laughing from upstairs. Um, but there are days where having to show up being somebody for somebody else. And I imagine as a parent, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat characterizing what this feels like to be a parent. I, I don't know, but you, you tell me, Rob. But like, there's a lot of, as a teacher, I have to show up to be somebody in service to somebody else. And you do that enough, that can also feel like, okay, I just need an hour to just not be anything for anybody. I need maybe a week <laughs> to not be anything mm. for anybody, you know? Um, like that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I repress this one a lot. So there's, um, 
you know, I remember vacations. I remember like not being surrounded by people constantly <laughs> 24 hours a day. Yeah. Cause I actually get a lot out of, you know, working solo. I get a ton out of collaborating. I think mm -hmm. anyone who's worked with me over the last, whatever, 25 years of my career, there's some kind of thing where I'm always looking to jam. Like I'm looking for us to get into a creative space yeah. and find new things in the world and inside of us and do that together right here, right now. And I'm like, whoo, let's go. But, and also, Sometimes I just want to just sit and stare at a wall or read a comic or scribble on paper until things come to me. I don't know. And uh, yeah, yeah, that those are very different things. And so if you're in a situation where you're not in the one where you want, uh, yeah, that's a tension, like a, a like tense tension, not attention, like I'm looking. Um, where uh, it feels like some some kind of tense want between what you have and or want and need. Mm -hmm. And that uh, when you hold on to that, that sort of tense feeling, to me, I, it's like the, the, that feeling alone isn't burnout. Burnout is sort of uh, sitting with that and not knowing what to do with it for some extended period, period of time. Yeah. And then... You're just sort of like, I'm I, now I don't feel great about it. I'm bummed or down yeah. because now, you know, I get it. I've identified what the, the situation, but now what? And as far as being a parent, you know, it, it's, um, I, I could, let's see. It's, it's an absolutely life uh, altering thing because it, it needs to be right and to to be good at it it's like i mean it's it's like you know i asking to become a parent and then becoming a parent and if, in part to sort of see like how can i be the best me in order to to be uh something of um like i don't know like connection and service and all that stuff for this uh family it's like it's the kind of learning experience like nothing else I've ever had because it is so it, it is, it is constant. And, uh, and that has a, a tensity, a, 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 a tension and intensity to it, but like how beautiful. And uh, I have grown a lot as a human being and I get moments like this where I get signals from time to time as far as like, how is this working out for my kids? Because I'm paying attention and we talk and all that stuff. And the, uh, I think this came up on a recent art and science punks. It was the latest one. I was just listening to it. This is such a good story. <laughs> Where <laughs> uh, our youngest asked uh, as right after, after dinner, I was, um, you know, clearing off the table and all this stuff. And uh, we were just starting to transition to the next thing in our, in our day. And uh, youngest goes, uh, is it, a, I, I might be misquoting, but she said something like, is it, is it a lot of work being our parents? It was, a, is, is, it was, I think what Kate said was, is it hard to be our parents? Is it hard? Okay. Yeah. There you go. It was, it was, is it hard? And I was like, <laughs> of course I'm in this situation. And, uh, and, and so I said, um, so I, I explained something that roughly went, relationships are work and every single relationship you have with any other human being is work. And that work is worthwhile because you can, um, well, become really connected and like helpful and healthy for one another and, and sort of help each other be what, um, be better. Right. And, and she was like, basically she was like, um, Sounds like it's hard, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> of course I gave a longer answer. Most, you know, most days the, my family's pretty, pretty um, comfortable and tolerant of, of my not concise answers. Yeah, but then you flipped the script on them. Uh, let's see, I'm forgetting what I did after yeah, that. You, you asked, is it hard to be our kids? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yes, we did. 
yeah because right because uh yeah kate asked that is it hard to be our kids and then both kids were like oh yeah it's super <laughs> hard being your kids <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, for those we will link to it in the show notes but that was um episode 82 minecraft family of the art science punks podcast uh i feel like we're coming up on break but another layer to burnout that i thought would uh it was worth putting in here is something i've noticed at least in myself and i'll, I'll share it in the spirit of does this resonate with anybody else anybody else feel this um when it's really bad and I'm feeling completely disengaged and disinterested in the work and uh, like I'm not um, applying myself properly or I'm not skillful in what I do, um, well-meaning friends will say, oh, but here's like five pieces of evidence that show that you're not bad at this and I don't trust them. Like I just, I am suspicious of any positive feedback when I'm in that headspace. And it's really weird because like objectively I can step back and go like, yes, I have evidence that I can do this thing, but it doesn't take away the feeling, right? The feeling is still persistent. So it's like, it's, it's, what's interesting is it's a feeling that in my experience, I can't talk myself out of very easily. Uh, I can occasionally, but most of the time it's something like I got to ride this thing out. Um, I mean, and, and it's, it's weird because like I appreciate my friends chiming in, but it's just like my internal dialogue is like, yeah, they're lying to you to make you feel good. I'm like, my friends aren't liars. <laughs> no, but they're lying, you know. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a pretty awesome conversation to have as, you know, as much as it might hurt or suck or not be fun. Um, but like it's, you're essentially uh, triangulating your own situation with – uh, and, and so like neuropsychology, I, you know, I casually look into this stuff because um, it helps with um, design and being human centered and stuff like that. But you have essentially your, um, you know, functionally, you've, you've got like sort of your, your primitive brain that is like this interconnection between your emotional brain and your, um, your sort of uh, intellectual brain, right? Mm. And so in a way you're having like a, a conversation among, among those, uh, those areas and it's almost... Uh, yeah, and there's a pretty good book, The Whole Brain Child, that I like. I like simple metaphors. So, you know, I like things that are like mental models that help me with with complex ideas because I'm not a doctor in neuropsychology. <laughs> uh, and I can carry through the simpler models easier than, you know, trying to remember, I don't know, more complicated explanations. And, uh, but they call it uh, in that book, they call it your upstairs brain and your downstairs brain. And the kind of like the stairs is that interconnection where it's like, um, like where you go and which uh, part of your cognition gets the greatest emphasis or is in more control. Um, it's, it's, um, it's sort of when you feel something at your, your sort of primitive brain's core, you, you probably go toward the emotional and sort of they're working together, but then it's, um, like how you frame things and whatnot can help you um, just, well, involve the rest of your brain, right? Because it's not like uninviting anyone from the conversation. That, that's the end goal. It's, it's to be integrated. Mm. Mm. That's good. So do you feel like we're uh, a good point to take a break? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. Okay. We characterize this situation. I think we did. Now let's talk about how, how we manage it, how we deal with it. I mean, we've been talking a little bit about that, but we'll dig deeper into it. Uh, in about a minute and a half, but first we have to thank some people who make this show possible. And those are the people who support us on Patreon. Yes, patreon.com slash leanatort is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you believe in Rob and Jersey and what we do, you can support us for as little as a dollar a month. You could also do a one-time donation, which we'll is like cancel at any time. But I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on a regular, ongoing basis. Ashley Knapp. Thank you, Ashley, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Ashley on Twitter at Control Alt Lee. And good to be curious. Thank you, good to be curious. It's, oh, it's Olivia Burton is good to be curious on Twitter. Thank you, Olivia. It means a lot to us. And Catherine Sugru. You can find Catherine on Twitter at Katsugru, K-A-T-S-O-O-G-R-O-O. And Brandon Dayton, longtime friend of the show. You can find Brandon on Twitter at Brandon Dayton. And Chris Watkins. Thank you, Chris, for believing in us and what we do. You can join them all at patreon.com slash where you will find every show we make. 
as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who, who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe space with fellow leaners. And it gives you access to... Did you like the way I did that, and? And it gives you access to the Lady Tart Discord, <laughs> where there's private channels where you can interact with fellow leaners and us, post some work in progress, access the Brain Trust in the Lena Tart Discord, patreon.com slash Art. Thank you to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot to us. It does. Thanks so much. <sighs> Whoa. Music means we're in the next part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did that come in hot? That felt like it came in hot. I don't know. Came in a little hot, and it's almost, almost like I fell into a den of alien <laughs> eggs where I'm like, ooh. <laughs> Didn't plan on this today. <laughs> Hopefully it won't be that intense uh, as we navigate the second part. So, you know, where I, I think in, when we were texting back and forth about this topic, you you suggested something about like identifying the patterns, looking for the systems that cause this. And I thought that is that is a very Rob thing to say, but it's also a very good way to approach it is like you get a signal. You get a signal from the world, from yourself, and you say, OK, this is a thing I'm experiencing. Now what? what where does it come from? Where does it come from? Helps me understand how to manage it. So, you know, what have you noticed in... Uh, let me just put this at the top. I want to put this disclaimer bar up and just go, journaling, we do a lot of journaling. There, we said it. Now we can move on. Um, so what do you notice uh, in, in <laughs> that become patterns and systems that cause this for you? Uh, let's see. I think we... <sighs> It reminds me a lot of, let's see. So the, uh, I'm always like looking for, for, for patterns with like, well, how can I design and, and how can I, well, and it's totally me doing self-medicating too with design where like I'm, I'm thinking of my own thoughts and how can I get better at these things and uh, more consistently finish projects, make projects that land with my audiences and all that stuff. It's, it's a combination of, you know, it's probably not a great metaphor to say self-medicating, but it's sort of a, um, a, you know, you, 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 you can learn a lot from your own experiences, right. Through, through journaling. Right. So yeah, journaling as an, as a disclaimer, but like, anyway, so yeah, noticing patterns. Um, and one patterns pattern I notice reminds me of game design that relates to competency, autonomy, and relatedness. And forgetting like where I've quoted this in a workshop, but then like competency, autonomy, and related, related relatedness actually point to this more overarching thing that that game designers started to use as constraints, which is uh, self determination theory, and that is a way to look at your own um, a characterize right. I mean, it's it's um, it's it's kind of like in the, in the first part where characterizing different aspects of cognition lets you sort of have a, a dialogue with those concepts. Now those concepts have words and, and, and uh, re meaning, right? Anyway, so competency, autonomy, and relatedness. Um, if I'm feeling skilled, that's a, that's a positive signal. If I feel like I can act upon what I see as needs and, and, you know, you know, interesting problems to solve. That's autonomy, right? And relatedness is like, am I sort of connecting overall to like why I'm doing this and who this is serving and all that stuff. So if any one of those is sort of, you know, going in a, in a, in a direction that's not positive or, or it's not feeling right or whatever for a long period of time, if I'm not feeling skilled and competent, if, if I don't feel like I have the choices and if I don't see the meaning anymore with it and then yeah any one of those are um sort of elements th that that create that are for you know, th that can easily fill in the very flexible recipe of burnout burnout's one of those dishes that you can make with lots of things <laughs> <laughs> go get the Mark Bittman book on that um, yeah, that, that maps onto what I was describing in the first part of the show when I solved this problem with this game show idea that I came up with is like, I felt competent I, and I felt that there was relatedness because it was, uh, solving a problem that served multiple parties in a way that I could describe, right? It wasn't just good for them because I felt like it was good for them. It was good for them because I, I could point out these things, these ways that this thing is good for the people who are participating in this thing. Um, 
And so like the relatedness was very apparent and clear. And so that gives me a rush of, you know, uh, whatever chemicals our brain makes to make us happy. Um, whereas when I don't have that, um, when I'm not sure who, for whom I'm making something, um, boy, does it make the work ex ex exceedingly difficult. Um, and, and in the case of like a web comic, like say like an Amazon Academy or Boulder and Fleet or the front, I'm making that for me. So like that relatedness is very apparent as well. I'm making this because I love making this. And if people like it, great. Yes, I want to make it sustainable. So I want lots of people to like it, but that's not the first reason I'm doing it, right? Um, so yeah, competency, autonomy, and relatedness. That's, that's a great triumvirate to look for and to like start deconstructing if you're feeling that sense of burnout. Um, and well, and, and we have some other attributes in the show notes that I think you can probably start to map to okay. any of those categories. Like if, uh, if uh, like I can get burnout from too much or too little of things, right? Mm. Uh, to, yeah. If I'm, you know, uh, if I described, uh, there was a gig I had during the time of Lean Into Art, right? That um, <clears throat> I needed to be extremely billable for a high, high, high percentage of my time. And uh, I told Jersey, it felt like I was breaking boards all day. And I probably mentioned it on the show back yeah. like, during that time. I do remember this. Like literally every single move, every moment. I know people who get super booked th throughout their days and like everything's a meeting. And then between the meetings is like solve a hard problem, but it's, but it's like things. Oh, yeah. It's, it's tough when, when things are so inflexible. And, and so it's like, I love hard problems, but do I love 200 hard problems? How about more like 10 or t somewhere between two and 10? That'd be nice. Um, yeah, and this is something we kind of, I don't know if we spent a lot of time on it in the first part, is then this whole question of self-care comes in there, right? Because like, um, you need to back away to give yourself the space to show up as your best self to, to break those boards again. And, but then you can start feeling guilt over wanting to disengage, right? I, I think that's something I've seen being expressed a lot right now as we're in this really difficult time uh, with a pandemic, with, you know, um, the, the social upheaval that's happening right now, uh, a lot of, a lot of positive change happens at, at great cost, right? And it can be difficult to watch it all happen. And then, so some people say, well, I need to back away. I need to re regroup myself. And like, it's interesting to me that they feel like they need to say it on a platform. Like they have to declare it, right? As if it's, it, I'm not, I'm not, um, suggesting or like blanket suggesting anybody's motivations. But for me, I know that part of my rationale for doing it would be like to say, like to give myself um, the out, not out, what am I trying to say? To sort of pre-apologize for not being as present, right? Like, look, I'm sorry, I need to, I need this space. And it, it's weird that I feel like I need to apologize for asking for that space because, and, and or even asking for the space because we need the space in order to show up as our full selves, Right, so that we can do the best job and and solve difficult problems and have difficult difficult conversations. Um, if I'm exhausted, uh, or angry, or burnt out, or tired, or frustrated, I'm not going to bring the best thoughts to the table, right? Um, and it's 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 a. I feel like I get caught sometimes in these self defeating loops of feeling guilty about not being as engaged every moment. Um, which like makes me not show up as refreshed when I finally show up again. <laughs> mm. there, that oh, it, it's really interesting and complicated. Um, because uh, let's see, so I heard so many things in what you just ex what you just shared because it's like um, <laughs> that was that was once again Jersey intellectually tumbling down the stairs. That's my new metaphor for when I do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think of it as that. It's, it's, uh, um, it's, I don't know. It's more like, like watching sh someone really good at shopping fly along the, the aisle. That's, that's super kind of you. But the picture I have in my head is the guy from Sesame Street who says three strawberry pies and then tumbles down the stairs. <laughs> I have a headline. It's a great idea I'm about to bring to you, but whoop, 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 whoop. Now it's everywhere. Sorry. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> I, I, now I interrupted you. <laughs> uh, well, I have, um, 
I have, I don't know, I guess I have magical pie reassembly abilities <laughs> if, if that's what's going on here. Because because what I heard was um, you're you're looking for giving, this is a combination of permission, giving yourself per permission and receiving permission, which, which to me reminds me of a, um, like an excused absence. Mm. And it's saying that I care about my commitment to this thing. Mm. Something has come up. And, yeah. Uh, and the, even having the ability to notice that the something has come up, think, gosh, there's so many important words like I noticed that get to be um, uh, loaded with emotion. And it's okay, like, you know, because we all experience what we experience and it's all juxtaposed with, you know, words and symbols that, you know, uh, for, for some self care is a hot button. And they're like, you know, hot buttons to me are signals that are like, oh, interesting. That's a place to investigate because one can ask if they are in a situation that, where they feel safe and comfortable to do so to say, why is this a hot button? And so let's, so if, if you're aware of the, the sort of exchange going on and the, and the sort of investment and cost and saying like, I'm here, I care. And yet I also have other things. I have a conflict going on. I need to resolve the conflict. I need to do some triage to address uh, my sleep or fitness or um, dietary needs or something. Um, space for getting energy that I can then bring back to this endeavor, right? Uh, taking a break is great. <laughs> yet also it's not always... Uh, you could be in an overall pattern because I think there's a combination here where things are, you have the events. Is any of these an event where it's like, Ooh, I didn't sleep enough last night. Or is it a lifestyle where you're like, Ooh, I didn't sleep enough last year. And, yeah. <laughs> and event versus lifestyle and all that. Mm -hmm. But having the vocabulary to notice the need and then to try to navigate how you're not, a, a person in a bubble, you're connected to something else and whatever. And how do you navigate that? It might be bumpy or awkward, however you choose to do it. Like folks, sometimes with the, with posting on social media saying like, I'm taking a break and this is why, what have you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a recent thing I started doing is putting on autoresponders on my email over the weekend just to sort of like, it, this is a small thing I'm trying to do to like enforce some boundaries in my life and say like, yep, I got it. Work doesn't stop. It doesn't stop for me either. But if your expectation is that I'm going to get back to you right away, I'm here to say I'm not. <laughs> and it's like, it's, it's a simple, gentle thing, but like, but yeah, I could see how that would be a way to let a group know that like, I'm still committed to this thing, but I'm going to be unreachable for this time to this time. Um, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Auto, auto responder. It's a certain, huh? It's like the inverse of the good morning tweet, right? Mm, um, mm. So one is showing up saying hi everybody, and the other one saying, um, "It's it's a it's a response to a ping." Like someone said, "Hey Jersey," and you're saying, "I'm not here right now." Yeah, I'll yeah. See you later. I, it, well, it was it was partially uh, inspired by something I saw another cartoonist do, where I emailed them and I got an auto response saying like, "I only answer emails on Tuesdays," which I was like, "Wow, that's that's luxury. <laughs> you have carved out boundaries for yourself that I am in absolute admiration for. Would that I could. Uh, I'm not saying you know uh, must be nice to be you, but I'm just saying like they did something. They did some mojo." that made me go like, I got to like start tapping into that mojo. <laughs> and it starts small by saying, Hey, guess what? You can't reach me on the weekends. Um, I, I do think that's a negotiation. That's an, that's the outcome of an ongoing endeavor. And yeah. I think that's an interesting thing to describe where it's like, if someone has built their career to a point where what have you, they've, they've negotiated great, um, like sustainable work lifestyle. Right. Mm -hmm. and uh, communication commitments and whatever other commitments and stuff. Uh, and, and perhaps even like, you know, of course, income would be part of that. Like there's this whole package that I think that might point to as like pretty desirable. And an interesting source also potentially is to notice what others have too, right? And mm -hmm. to be like, um, you could be inspired, not, but 
not everyone would take that away. Some people would go like, oh, must be nice. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm it's totally busted on having that mindset many times throughout my life, right? Uh, but I, I think the more useful mindset that I've, and this is nothing we can talk about, it's like, like training ourselves into new habits is um, training myself to say out loud, wow, that's awesome they could do that. I wonder how I can do that, right? Um, Because the other one that I pointed at in the first part was like not trusting people's input when I'm feeling rotten. And so a a habit I've been trying to cultivate within myself is respond in gratitude even if I don't feel it, right? So like if somebody says something kind about me, I'm like, oh, thank you so much for saying that. What a kind thing to say. That that is very meaningful. And and this is the thing, like you do it enough, you start to believe it. (laughs) So it is, it's like, isn't that part of like cognitive behavioral therapy is, uh, is like actually like practicing something and then it becomes part of your belief system. Yeah, totally. I think that is, um, I don't remember the, the like simple characterization of it, but it's essentially the, the, you know, fake it till you make it. Yeah. Um, but as a, as a useful tool and discipline, um, where it's kind of like, and I, I th- really, I, d- I believe in it too, where I think there's something to say, like, um, I think metaphor is like if well if you keep doing that your face will get stuck that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That that's, eh, that's, I think I would call that lossy compression, and uh, the but the idea that if you act happy you'll be more happy that kind of thing has has merit right. But there could yeah. be a lot of neural situations going on that make that provide barriers that need to be overcome as well at the same right. time. Right. And um, so you know, everyone's situation just uh, varies with, with that. But, but, um, but yeah, um, practicing something lets you get better at it. That's a pretty um, repeatable pattern. Yeah. Uh, what are some other things that you could have too much or too little of that can cause the burnout and noticing the too much or too little, like helps you bail water out of the, out of the sinking dinghy. Hmm. Um, I think any, I can get overwhelmed by positive stuff or negative stuff. So like too big of a queue of things to read. Um, tough to choose. Now I have, you know, okay, I understand the, the, um, the cognitive, um, what is it? So logical fallacies and cognitive biases. So I don't, so I don't know what this is characterized at, but like choice paralysis, mm. um, where it's like, I feel a sense of loss because I can't pick among all these awesome things. Um, that's yeah. hard. Um, but it's also, I can feel not great when I have too many things going on in a triage where it's like, oh, multiple deadlines and multiple stages of, of creative project development and research to get to you know this deadline or that deadline, whatever. And just going like, you know, in the triage, getting lost in the um, so much to, you know, um, and even though I like, I could, I probably am liking almost every single thing I, I have committed to, but like, it doesn't feel great when there's too much. Well, I guess that's another piece of this too. That's worth looking at is that I think both of us are, we work both. I, I, I think it's fair to say both of us work pretty hard and we both, I would say broadly speaking and probably even minutely speaking, Virtually everything we do, we find great meaning in what we do, which is like a really awesome problem to have, right? Like to feel aligned with the work you're doing is a rare privilege. And that can also make the burnout start to sort of redouble on itself. Like when you feel it, you feel like, well, why? I don't get to feel this way. Um, it's not it, right. Like what, what kind of a what kind of a creep am I that I'm getting burnt out on drawing? Really? You know, this is what you dreamed of doing It's your dream. It's the end of the movie. Yeah, happily ever after. You just you're just good all the time, and you like doing it. You know. Uh, um, I'm so embarrassed that I complain about things like Unity. You know, <laughs> I I just where I'm like, if 12 year old me had that tool, yeah, I'd throw a computer at my 40 some year old self. Be like, shut your hole, old man. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. figure it out because yeah. this is like this is magic. You're a, you get to play with magic. Shut your, shut your face, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so, okay. Uh, yeah, I guess sometimes having an, a younger, older 
self-dialogue is helpful and sometimes it's not helpful. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is interesting. It's a signal, right? Where it's like, okay, well, uh, what are the opportunities in what I'm experiencing? Yeah. There's a reframing there too, right? It's like, um, I had, uh, a weekly commitment to do something with a friend and I had to not do it one week. And I said like, Hey, I'm really sorry that, you know, how stuff came up. I can't be there. And they said, that's okay. I'm just going to reflect on the fact that we've had an unbroken streak for a really long time, you know? And it's like, wow, yeah, that's right. Instead of saying like, Oh, you're not here now. You're saying, but you've been here all these other times. Like what, what a lovely way to like recast the situation. Uh, mm. And so I think I feel like that that's another another thing that is like a, maybe an emotional trick we can play on ourselves because it's not it's 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 an intellectual trick but it has an, an emotional um, switcheroo in there as well. Yeah, it's absolutely like framing is a really useful thing to uh, to practice, and it's a way to sort of get a foothold to to start to get unstuck. One of the uh, like we've we've talked about this before. Um, I forget what episode, but it's you know right around the time when I. Um, Oh gosh, what what was that book? It's escaping me. It's one of the books I mention a lot, but um, it's uh, Kelly McGonigal's um, uh, "The Upside of Stress," and I, what's funny is you don't read a book like that if you if you're like everything's great all the time, right? <laughs> I mean, you read you read a, a book like like that to be like, well, I want to, I want to have more competency and agency and, and relatedness, even if I'm feeling, you know, bummed or overwhelmed or stressed out. And yeah, I mean, it's reframing is just a really useful thing you can do. And that that's where I like I tie reframing in um, with my yearly goals and all that kind of stuff where having a talisman is always a thing where it's, it's like anything to connect with a picture that's outside of this negative current emotion. Uh, is is useful. See things, oh, see can, things can I, differently. Can I can I get you to restate that sentence again? Anything to connect with something that's outside of this emotion is that how you said it? Yeah. Uh, so uh, well, I won't say it. So part of the jamming experience is like I'll I will I'll hit the I'll I'll do the rhythm or the solo right the first time, and <laughs> then I will I will get it right then the hundredth time. Come on, Kirk Hammett. Come on, Kirk Hammett. You could do this. <laughs> okay. If I'm Kirk Hammett, let me stomp on my wah pedal more. I love the wah pedal. And uh, anyway, so anyway, it, so if you can connect, so I, I, I envision it as being sort of, you know, stuck inside of emotion. So if you can reach out and connect with something that's outside of that, that helps sort of re-anchor you and, mm. um, it's something that reminds you of other positive things. It doesn't have to be directly this, but like, well, this is the big, this is the purpose. And this is the reason I'm doing this. It's because of my goals. Mm -hmm. And this talisman or this word or poem or mantra reminds me of these goals, which now I'm on, now I'm on a different thought pattern. I'm thinking of other things, seeing things differently outside of that emotion. That's great. I'm glad. I'm glad that you were able to elaborate on that. I, I think that that's that's a really really cool thought. It's a great uh, practice to take on in order to, uh, you know, if not bail out of burnout, but at least get you, um, you know. Well, I feel like that's a practice that can be refined and, and become more of a habit, habitual thing, right? Because I will say, like, while I do feel burnout, uh, you know, like anybody else. Um, practices like that help keep it at bay right like noticing like th i think this is this is what this whole half was meant to be about was like noticing where it comes from and then developing practices to um like like taking uh vitamin c at the onset of a cold right it's like okay well let's make this as short and as painless as possible it's gonna hurt but let's let's mitigate it somewhat mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, you're um, reconnecting with your with your sense of agency somehow. I mean, even if it's, it doesn't have to. It's not instant. It doesn't have to work. the The pain will linger probably, but yet, um, in the progression, it's like you'll, you um, hopefully, depending on your situation, not being, uh, you know, uh, neuro psychology normative, what have you. 
um, yeah, these, these practices can help mm -hmm. just, uh, get started on it feeling different. So, cause like burnout is, is one of those feelings that it's worth trying to, um, introduce the, a pattern that gets you out of it. Cause burnout probably doesn't lead to, um, you know, so a lot of times people, people burn out. And like, you think, think about typically what that leads to. If you're, if you're stuck in it forever and you don't feel like you have competence agency, competence, uh, autonomy and relatedness in, in there, what does that lead to eventually? It leads to like giant change, right? Which might be good. Maybe it's a change of job or relationship or something like that. But like, um, hopefully you, I don't know, like, again, this is my journaling, my, your mileage may vary, but like, hopefully you're bringing as much of your whole self to that big choice, as opposed to saying, well, it's up to you burnout. What should I do? Right? <laughs> I don't think burnout's not going to do a good job for you. I don't think <laughs> other than like, it's point, it could be pointing a huge, like, signal at something that's worth, you know, investing and making some choices about, but letting burnout make the choice for you. I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm suspicious of that being a, being a good approach. Ah, well, I feel like we had a good walk around this topic, Rob. What do you think about taking another break and, um, coming back with our two minute practice for the week? Yeah, let's do that. All right. Oh, I got somebody knocking at my door. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, we, there's, uh, radon remediation is, is here at my, uh, house today. So there's work going on in the background. I think he wants to come in. Yeah. No. Nope. We're gonna take a break. No. Okay. Yes. Come in. <laughs> okay. I'll go get the door. <laughs> I'll be right back. Rob, if you could, uh, you know, take us through some of the things that you want to talk about. I'll put the camera okay, on sounds you. Good. All right. All right. Well, uh, after our break here, which may be, uh, this is an interesting kind of break. Normally, this is sort of our, um, you know, sharing the, uh, some sponsorship, uh, like who, who is behind this podcast? How do we support it? How do we make it sustainable? And that happens to be us, right? So a lot of our projects help put us in a position to keep the podcast going. Yeah, the Patreon is part of the support. And we're, you know, looking at ways to, to grow that support and you know gather more patrons but then of course we love it if you um either just you know work with us Thanks. with the products that we sell and um of course uh well jersey's back so what how's it going <laughs> i'm back and let's talk about some of the other people who make this uh show possible as rob was leading us up those people are us we make the show possible so the thing that I make that I hinted at at the top of the episode is this game show that actually at the time of this recording uh, comes out tomorrow and it's on the Ann Arbor Art Center's Facebook page. They're doing a Facebook premiere like it's like a live video kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's live, but it's not live kind of thing. But it's the Super Comics Challenge game show is um, like the, the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival was supposed to be this June. Obviously, it didn't happen this June, so we're doing some virtual events to sort of celebrate what would have been the uh, A2CAF 2020, like the 12th year of doing the show. And uh, part of A2CAF has always been drawing game shows where it's playful, it's fun, it's, uh, it's gameful, but you learn something about the art of cartooning through the interplay of the different players and hosts. And so I wanted to do something like that this year, but in a virtual sense. And uh, this is what I was hinting at earlier, where it's like, I feel like this has a sort of unique premise. It is a, an interesting approach to doing online uh, drawing competition. And uh, some of my favorite cartoonists lined up to help me with the pilot. Uh, Greg Shegel is one of the guests. Jeremy Burley, uh, another longtime friend of like Lead Into Art in previous podcasts that I've been a part of. And uh, Aaron Polk. My former student now made good as a professional comic book colorist and cartoonist. And even uh, my latest mentee, 11-year-old uh, Elizabeth, they all compete in drawing challenges. It's at noon Eastern time, Friday the 26th. Uh, the video will stay up on the Ann Arbor Art Center's Facebook page, so you can go there uh, even if you're watching this episode way later. So a super comics challenge. I'm pretty excited about it. That is awesome. 
I, uh, I'm, I'm excited to see it reach its audience. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's such a cool thing. You have to check it out. Um, it, it's, uh, I know it was a, it was a, it was a challenging project, but getting to see like what's kind of, what's possible and fun in this virtual space of, of the creativity and drawing and the live event. It's a good one. Thanks. Yeah. You've, you've actually seen what it looks like when it's, when it's done. So yeah, I'm, I was grateful for your feedback on it as I was developing it too. Uh, but speaking of you, Rob, you have a store. I do. And what I would like to point you to also is, um, so my store has workshops that are at Skillshare or at Gumroad. By all means, check that out where it's, you know, user-centered design mixed with creativity and storytelling. A lot of good stuff to check out. I've got my coaching, all that stuff. It's, it's um, a lot of great ways to connect with me to help you navigate um, some creative challenges or career stuff and uh, even with your team. But then I've got something new, Jersey. Oh. I have a Patreon, <gasps> which I know it's super funny because, so my Patreon is a bit of a, it's, it's, it's my lab, it's my dojo. It's where I create articles and games and workshops and, and doodles because I've got a bundle of workshops I've been working on and sort of, uh, doing, you know, like turning a lot of things I've been talking about into learning modules. And some of those I turn into talks and do at different events. And so you get, you know, some development behind the scenes and like, how do I develop these kind of, these kind of products? But then there's like actually coaching built in too. So I've got three levels. I've got the encouraging reader level. I've got the journal podcast supporter where um, you will actually get special patron only episodes of the Polytechnicast called Polytechnicast um, uh, Super Patron Z. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's also the group product lab. And the group product lab is a, a once, once a month meeting within a few check-ins along the way where um, there's, you know, any, you know, any group that's around can, uh, and, and, you know, is, is a patron at this level, but up, only up to 10 people through, through Patreon. And uh, you get together and it's, it's like um, you're, you're working through the process of bringing your product into its, its next level, its next stage or whatnot. And you get to do that uh, not alone. And that's the benefit of doing that in a group. Yeah, we could do solo coaching, happy to help with that. But then there's a different, different kind of experience you can get where you get to see um, the kind of things other people making products and things they believe in are going through. So there you go. Lots of stuff going on there. I've already, I've got a, a few goodies posted as well, as far as, um, you know, an article, uh, getting a uh, guitar fretter for free and, and, and some other good stuff too. So check it out at patreon.com slash Rob Stenzinger. Patreon.com slash Rob Stenzinger. You can join a brain trust there. That is exciting and valuable. All right. Awesome. Uh, and then the last thing we hope you will, you will check out today is the Discord. We have a Lean Into Art Discord where you can interact with fellow leaners and us. And there are three public channels. Uh, and there's three channels that are only for people who support us on Patreon. This will be linked in the show notes in this episode and every episode. So thanks to everybody who's been interacting with us there. It means a lot. Um, I'm so excited that you have a Patreon now, Rob. <laughs> speaking of nervous oh my yeah putting <laughs> that into the into the world was really something yeah. and uh yeah it's been an, an adventure it's it's like i see the intertwinedness between um you know the 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 writing and drawing coding teaching all that stuff making yeah. products so this is the this is my hypothesis i'm trying to uh help others like um some of the things where uh, you know, it's like, what is it like to work with me? Right. What's it like to be on my team or whatever? That's, that's where you, you get a taste of that. All right. Um, gotten, got a lot of good feedback over the years, not trying to, you know, toot my own horn in a, in a lame way, but like, it's uh, like, we all have our own things that we bring to the teams. And I, I think this, this is a combination of like my lab, but then I make it a shared practice too. So. That's great. Okay. So it's time now for the two minute practice. So this is the part where I say, hi, Rob. Hi, Jersey.
two minute practice so, time the 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 affordable way to introduce more practice into your work as a visual communicator yeah this is um it you know it's it's not like you're going to uh, probably produce your your next uh whatever 50,000 word novel or the um uh like a a giant mural or interactive installation two minutes at a time but i bet there's something about that whole creative experience that you could you could find a way to practice two minutes at a time and that's what we're doing that's what we're doing all right so what are we doing this what what did we do this week that we could talk about well we talked about reverse engineering some uh like like visual compositions taking a look at something and saying what makes that up what am i seeing and i i think in the description we we talked about like sort of what shapes and stuff do you see in there how do they relate um, so how did the how did this practice go for you this week jersey uh it evolved i only did like three sessions but the last one i did i did this morning and it was after looking at the notes that you put together based on your experience and i was like oh I was doing something similar to what you were doing. And then when I saw what you were reacting to, it, it made my last practice much more specific. Um, so mm. what I did, I can pull it up on screen, but you're gonna have to look at the, uh, the Twitch stream to see what I did. Um, okay. But uh, I work on this other podcast with my buddy Hoover uh, called the 4 Million Years Later Podcast. It's a Transformers show. And uh, one of the things that I, I talked about uh, what I bring to the table as a co-host is I'm really coming at it from a visual storyteller standpoint. So I'm always looking at shots and looking at um, how did the storyboard artists and animators frame up something to make it look visually interesting, given that the, the, the 1980s Transformer cartoon doesn't have like the most over the top stellar animation of all time. Right. We're not seeing it's not Pinocchio, you know, um, but it's good. Uh, but, it, but anyway, like I, my, one of the things that I talk about a lot on the show is like what I think what part of what makes it so good is the way they frame their shots. So I'm always talking about that. So I have a lot of screen grabs of the series that were just like sort of in my back pocket as I've uh, brought them onto the show, uh, time and time again, uh, to discuss. So what I started out doing was just taking the shot and recreating it just in color shapes, which I have up on screen right now. I don't know if you can oh. see it or not. Yeah, I, I I have a look at that. So I like I I specifically do screenshots that like I think are especially pretty to talk about on the show anyway. So uh, I started out by just doing that with like just using colors to simplify it down into a squint test of sorts. I did one of here's Optimus hugging Bumblebee, saying you saved me uh, from Attack of the Autobots, which you can listen to at four million years later dot com. And then I have this shot that uh, Hoover and I talked about in the episode. Uh, I believe this is Roll For It from season one. And it's like just before the act break to the commercial, it's a shot of Soundwave saying, prepare for oblivion as he holds Megatron and is ready to fire him. And it's another one where it's like, look at the, I guess like what I was starting out was trying to look at what's the re relationship of negative to positive space in these shots. That's really what I was going for there. Um, mm. But then I saw your notes this morning and uh, saw that you were talking about no, no tan, uh, mm -hmm. no tan drawing or no tan studies, mm -hmm. and which are uh, could you describe that? So uh, it's nothing I've I've done formally, but then just along comes. What's funny? We, you mentioned uh, Jeremy Burley earlier. Well, uh, in my feed, I follow Jeremy in a, in a couple places, and I noticed he he was doing these sort of um, thumbnailish size uh, studies that look like sort of a contrast of the you know like um, you know light and dark value, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, like what sort of emerges. And before I, I noticed his him sharing that before I actually even started uh, my two minute practice. And I just was like, okay, well, this is that, that, that's what got me influenced. And I was, I just was off and running, exploring that direction. But these no tan studies are looking at the, um, you described it perfectly, Jersey, the, the, essentially the, the, um, the relationship of the, um, uh, well, positive, negative space and light and dark value. And I'm forgetting the, let's see, there's a, uh, um, I think it's sort of a, an Anglicization of 
some it's like a portmanteau of a couple of words that uh, don't aren't english words but, okay um but it's it's, a, it's essentially the um the yeah positive negative space relationship it, it's a japanese term which literally means light dark harmony Hmm. So, yeah, I, I realized I wasn't really, when I was doing mine, I wasn't thinking so much about light and dark. I was just thinking about positive and negative space. So, but the last one I did, I tried thinking about it in terms of value. And so I did this this one of this image of Starscream. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed a lot on the, the podcast, the uh, 4 Million Years Later podcast, is there's a lot of diagonal shots. There's a lot of shots where everything is composed in a diagonal. And I, I can only surmise, I can only guess that like, it's just, it's what makes the show feel exciting. Because like, again, not a lot of stuff moves in the show compared to a lot of modern animation. So, um, so yeah, so that was my experience with it. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, it was fun to recreate the images to the best of my ability with like the, the proportions and relationships of all the imagery. Um, and it sort of like gave me some evidence to bring to the 4 million years later podcast in the future of, you know, like, uh, standing on something that actually, you know, um, has some testing behind it to show that like, this is why these shots work. How was your experience, Rob? And I'll switch to your desktop video. Interesting. Yeah. Investigation. Um, okay. The, let's see, do, 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 I will switch over to there and okay. I'm at my other location, my desk cam. And, uh, like for me, that's so interesting. The, like you used, um, the, the transformers and I I found um, a few different sources like uh, uh, you know some comics a couple you know, a few comics in a in magazine and actually um, I I uh, I read through maybe or reread like <laughs> as a as a side note not part of the two minute practice but because I sort of uh, I picking up the invincible trade paperbacks again that were on my shelf. Uh, I all of a sudden started to notice patterns in the overall, um, like the composition, but there's a lot of times this, this idea of these three tall vertical panels that thematically, anytime you see that, it's not typically about uh, three things that are happening, happening near each other. It's like you're, you're checking in on a situation that may have some simultaneity, but it's, it's like people are dealing with stuff all across the planet, right? And you, but you check in on this character's situation, that character, and then that character, right? And sometimes there will be even like uh, two pages facing. So across the fold, you'll see all these, it's like this really fast check-in kind of thing with these vertically arranged panels. And so um, I was like, there's a, um, I guess once it, when it dried, some of the contrast went away, but, but I, I was trying, I was using uh, some, some generic uh, Blick uh, clones of the uh, the Copic markers, mm. um, alcohol based so markers, el alcohol based markers, um, and um, they, uh, yeah, they're 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 fine. Um, I I think they've been on my shelf a little too long and starting to get, to get a little bit uh, uh, depleted. But um, anyway, so that that's um, you know so. I, I did the, the a study from Invincible and I just picked a page in one of the, you know, and I forget which, which of the five or six I ended up picking from, but um, good reminder. Wow. Does that comic get violent? Holy moly. It's, I forgot <laughs> how hyper violent Invincible is uh, because like I started in the beginning and waited for the second graphic novel to come out and things don't quite get spicy until then. It's like, and, and I, but somehow I was anchored on that one. But uh, the uh, yeah, anyway, it's good stuff. Not all ages. Um, then I, I remember looking at some behind the scenes stuff back in the Scott Pilgrim uh, days or what or whatnot, where um, what Brian Lee O'Malley was. Uh, he uh, talked a lot about balloon spotting and stuff. And I thought, well, let me see, let me see how this works. And so I, just, I literally I flipped to a random page, pulling a little bit of a biblio bibliomancy move, and I thought, all right, mm -hmm. random page. What do you got as far as visual flow? And, um, and I'll be darned if I didn't notice a pattern of uh, using the, um, the, the fully 
um, spot black sections to like guide my eye in mm -hmm. harmony with mm -hmm. the angles of the balloons. And I was like, geez, I've never laid out a page that well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, cause I mean, literally the spot blacks. So like you can see that it's summarized in a way in this, this, the, the thumbnail, but like uh, the flow from here to here, to here, to here. And that's just something that I, you know, sort of summarized in my quick uh, no tan ish style value study. Um, so anyway, and I bet if I dug deeper, I'd find more harmonious relations and stuff like that too, as far as probably panel size and all that stuff. I, I like that you're doing this with the entire comics pages. And I wonder if that's something I should, I know, I, I don't wonder. I know this is something I'm, I need to do in my comics classes is issue this as a assignment, take some note cards, do two minute studies of the light and dark relationships of the shapes on the page, because that would be such a quick way. If you made that practice a habit, that would be such a quick way to level up your layout skills, right? Oh I agree gosh. because you're, because just asking yourself, like, what am I seeing and what is working? And yeah. um, then this was, I, I, there was some, some page in this imagine effects that I have from, uh, I don't know. Do you keep magazines? I, um, uh, mm -hmm. this thing's from 2006. <laughs> Um, but, but this darn magazine cost me 15 bucks in 2006. So I was, uh, you know, I don't feel like I'm just going to throw it out. Um, but anyway, it, this is, I guess one of my interests is, uh, the coloring style in fantasy painting and whatnot. So I always, I revisit this. You can see in my, some of my works I, I post that I revisit and, and play with this, but, um, I still feel for after all these years, it's just something I'm, I'm practicing along the side as one of my illustration styles. And, um, so, you know, I got these as a resource. I, I, there was some robot character or no, a mech, uh, armored up human and armored up human and standing in a sort of a fantasy landscape. And I was like, well, what's working about this? And I, I think, it, you know, the, the sort of light tones of the the fantasy landscape and stuff like that it was really it's looking at well this character is looking that way and that's certainly a design choice that well that draws my attention but also on top of it their giant shoulder cannon is pointing that way and this their their other characters even reinforcing that too so clearly um you know it's not just the the light and dark it's the subject and what's the subject doing mm. so that's mm -hmm. what kind of so yeah, I, I did this practice a few times, but um, um, you know, not all. I suppose I'll show you some that I don't think were as uh, successful or interesting. You know, so it's like I have th those that seem to you know I, I learned a lot more from, but then there was others where I just was like, you know, didn't learn a lot about that one. I picked one panel, and this was another one from Invincible, but I didn't learn a ton from this. Just like, yep, first lines and a fist. Um, <laughs> but um, a landscape. And so some of it too is like the practice of this where it's like two minutes, eh, it, it wasn't quite enough for me to do the kind of, a kind of study for my current skill level and speed. So, uh, because I think I would have gotten more out of this landscape uh, fantasy painting study it would, if I would have spent more time or did that classic, hey, let's do one thing to put like one output two minutes at a time, but you know, don't try to finish the whole thing in two minutes. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah that i guess that's that's another thing that's worth like underlining is this idea that uh not each and every one of them has to be done in two minutes it could be like okay well i'm gonna have to revisit this one tomorrow with another with another two minutes and maybe you have four for the week to show by showing up every day right or you have one big one you know that's that's the whole idea is like just see what you can accomplish in two minutes whether it's doing something um discrete each day or cumulative or some combination of the two. Yeah, that's, the, and, and I guess I, I think I want to be more flexible about switching between those modes instead of saying at the beginning of the week, this is the thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I can see the trade-offs because it's nice to practice the same thing, even if it f doesn't work. Right. Um, so it's, uh, I guess, another thing to experiment with. Mm-hmm. Well, that said, how about we talk about what we want to do with the next two minute practice? Right. Hmm. 
Well, we've been doing some visual development. Mm -hmm. Are there, uh, let's see, what would be a practice? We, we have the, the main Lean Into Art cast this week has a bit of a um, sort of a, like, a, I guess a nurturing self-care kind of thing. A, uh, is there anything along that path that might be a, I think a I have an idea. While? I think okay. I have an idea. What do you think? Um, take two minutes to um, brainstorm ways in which you could express more gratitude in your life to people in your life. Um, I, I have a friend who is very careful and very deliberate about making sure that every time we part ways, he expresses to me how meaningful our time is together, which can, it can sometimes feel like a lot. It can sometimes feel like, like, okay, I got it. We're good, you know, but that's not the point. The point isn't to seek reciprocation. The point is just that he wants to make sure that I know in no uncertain terms that our time is meaningful for him, right? Um, and I feel like like that's the moment I like came around to looking at it that way. I was like, that is such a good practice to do because th there are opportunities to express gratitude everywhere in our lives all the time. And how much better off would we all be if we had that as a habit in our lives to point out? Because like the thing that I, I, I point out to my students when we're talking about doing critique and I'm like, well, okay, we build each other up. We don't tear, tear each other down. So you got to find something where if you don't like what they did, you have to investigate what they were after, what, they were, what their game was, what their, their hope and their goal was. And then if you know how to help them get there, help them. That's what cartoonists do. I mean, that's that, this is the way I'm framing it for the younger generation, so that they hopefully all show up and not be jerks to each other. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I tell them that this is the way we all act. And yeah, there's a there's a rude awakening when then they get there and there's some jerks in the in the in the pond. But like, hopefully they'll the the, the realization will be like this is this is the aberration. <laughs> we we get rid of that guy and not get rid of that guy like that. You know what I mean? But ejecting yeah, from I mean, the, ejecting from the tribe. Uh, groups need to show their what they believe in. So yeah. And so, thank you. Thank you for, <laughs> but anyway, so what I'm getting at here is, is that part of this is training us to be more mindful of opportunities to express gratitude. Two minutes, brainstorm ways that you can express gratitude in your daily life, people that you could express gratitude to. And I mean like even interactions at the grocery store, right? Mm -hmm. um, casual infinitesimal interactions, neighbors, the, the mail delivery, you know, whatever it is. Uh, that, how, what so, do you think? I like that a lot. I mean, to me, it's like, uh, what are the events and, and who are the, the, the sort of the, the people? Uh, because we're not, I mean, what I'm hearing, it's not like, or, or maybe it's, it's like, oh yeah, morning coffee. Thank you. Morning coffee. It's more like, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, um, that's that's good too. But I'm saying like like actually making like a an action that interacts with the world, right? Right. That's what I wanted to make sure I was hearing. So yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, I I think that sounds really useful. Like when are those times you you're connecting, you're running into people, social distance or not, or how does that work? I mean, is it harder? I mean, if you're wear, you're wearing a mask in public, how how do you do the gratitude thing? Because it's 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 so easy to have the um, the the thank you world smile on right mm -hmm. and it's like there's a difference when you're walking around with that kind of smile then um um and it's not like ear to ear you know villainous smile i mean just just i'm glad to be here i'm glad you're here smile like i, mm -hmm. I actually did an experiment with that when i um and and that just it changed how i uh, when I worked in uh, sort of a downtown setting in, in Minneapolis and you're going through the Skyway and there's all kinds of people and all kinds of circumstances in life that you, you walk by and run and, and, and um, encounter. And I changed instead of being like sort of um, like functional emotionalists looking around, uh, I'm like, I'm going to smile a little and, and not, I don't like, I meant like, like hearing a yoga teacher who was like, when you do that, instead of grimacing or trying to avoid it, just feel positivity and having a, having a slight smile while you're trying to do that thing. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, yeah, well, while I'm trying to, you know, function in this hustle and bustle instead of grimacing or looking serious or, or uncaring, what if I look just a little bit caring? And I get that that has problems depending on who you are and all that kind that of stuff. That is exactly but, right. Yes. Yes. The definitely mileage may vary. Um, yes. I, but contextualizing that's how, so it's just like, all right, I don't know. It's a tangent that I've, I've opened up, but it's a, um, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> gosh, social humans. We are so tough to deal with. So many predatory <laughs> negative yes. things we got to watch out for. Yes. Gosh, darn it. Yeah. Well, Be- maybe yeah. I guess in that case, I felt this, um, I felt lighter, lighter hearted. And I don't know how that could be transmittable or helpful for everybody, Mm-mm. which is, which is a bummer, which I'm, uh, I wonder that'll be something that I try to explore in this two minute practice. Yeah. Um, like, well, and this you know, is, I, I think expressing gratitude. It's like, cause that can lead to all kinds of negative situations. Right. Too. Right. Um, if gosh, that's so interesting and yeah. difficult. I, I have, I have my own experiences with certain people who misread my joy and gratitude as something else. Right. And, and act in a way that was not asked for. Um, and so I can imagine that happening to you. I, I think it's worth underlining this as we explore it, is that I didn't say necessarily that we should practice what we write down, but this is brainstorming it. And then that will give us a first draft that we can drill down through and see what is the stuff that we can action, we could perform action on in a, in, a, in a way that is safe and unambiguous. Well, and, and uh, unintrusive. It's not, you're mm-hmm. trying to intrude and impose on others. So that's, that's where I think you, where lines get crossed is about yeah. being um, uh, encountering others and expecting them to participate in your, your circumstance. So how could you have this, like this independent care and appreciation, mm-hmm. gratitude and that's, there you go. Like, so I, I get it's a draft. It's not going to be perfect. And, uh, but as I'm, as I'm uh, working and brainstorming for me, I'll try to think about that, that mm-hmm. other, that aspect, like, um, yeah. how, how could it, yeah, how could it be unintrusive? Yeah. All right. Well, that's why it's a practice, right? This isn't performance. <laughs> it's practice. All right. Well, let's get to it. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jersey. And with that, I think we have done a podcast. What do you think? I I agree. That was that was, mm. that was great. I appreciate um, appreciate you walking around the the big topic of of burnout. And um, yeah, hopefully we've got some helpful things in there for well for us and for for folks in the community. I'm really curious, like you mentioned in the beginning, wanting to hear to hear from uh, the leaners out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's let's what, let's what hear like from you, you in the Discord. Um, okay, we record the show weekly on Thursdays, usually at noon Eastern time, 11 a.m. Central. We stream it live on twitch.tv slash Lena Tuart, and then we click it as a podcast at leanatuart.com and patreon.com slash Lena Tuart. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanatuart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. Well, and I have been Rob Stenzinger, also of leanintoart.com, and I'm Rob Stenzinger, all kinds of places on the social networks, like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.